Hey everyone, it's 7.05 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, February 15, 2022 years from something, I guess. It is, it's a Tuesday, it's a super cold Tuesday, not super cold so far since I've been up here in sort of west central Michigan, it has been far colder than this, um, it's about 20, close to 20 degrees, super dry super dry i'm telling you it gets so dry it has gotten so dry the snow on on the colder days when there's snow on my truck like i don't even have to brush it off it sort of um disintegrates into the air when i touch it it's pretty dry dries you out telling you totally dries you out like i have problems keeping saliva in my mouth it's that dry so i mean how do i deal with it <clears throat> well i drink coffee <laughs> naturally so this is my second time trying this the first time i got way too caught up in talking about terms and similar terms that weren't important to this one <laughs> They were kind of, but not that important. Because I looked at the clock, I was like, oh, it's 15 minutes in and I've been talking about this one glyph. Maybe not the right format. This format, briefs, it's more about ideas. So look, if the Bible for the most part is to be viewed as consistent, we have to have a consistent source, author, repetitive themes. <clears throat> Not saying they can't progress, because you would hope to see progression. Maybe in the same way that you see that man has regressed. Even if there's progression, it's like uh, building a house, building anything, right? It doesn't always look the same. You know, uh, at the start, it's stakes, a series of holes, um, maybe forms, and other, you know, little projects around the, the property, depending on what's going in there. You know, is uh, the sewer line being tied in with the city? Do they have a sewer line running? Is there a septic going in? Is there a well going in? And all that stuff. But it's still a house. There's still a form. There's an idea to it. There is a design. And it is simply progressing. It may look different along the way. Same house, same design, same idea, just progressing. That's what we should see. What we shouldn't see, unless we missed those ideas in the first place, and that's a possibility. We're gonna, I'm going to talk about that. What we shouldn't see is entirely new concepts being introduced at a point. That should set off red flags. Really should. Whether we like the concepts or not, that's not what's important. What's important is, can we find those concepts in some way, shape, or form? And I, I would say in a pretty solid way. Not in a fantasaical way. A way that we really have to read into to see it. Do we see it? in a pretty clear way. So, I've mentioned this before, probably in the ob Obery hours mostly, but it's something that's been nagging at me for a while now, that, that I mention it and I think about it. And it's the fact that... <sighs> okay. Salvation. 
let's say salvation, heaven, hell, afterlife. And maybe salvation's bad, that's bad. And I picked it up because I just, I went to a random website that was supposed to be covering the main themes uh, in the New Testament. And they had salvation on there. And when I look at salvation, I think of, well, this is what most people think. When they see salvation, the first thing that comes to their mind is an afterlife. Although, this is the bizarre, I think this is the bizarre um, mind job that's been pulled is how we associate things that maybe we shouldn't be associating per se right? based on what evidence we have so when people see um, the term salvation they think of salvation they do think of it in the sense of their eternal soul even the people who don't believe in a, an eternal conscious burning torment and suffering, which I do not because I don't find the evidence in Scripture. I don't find the evidence in the character of Yahweh that would lead me to believe that he is that bizarrely, morbidly sick and in love with that much uh, in, infliction of pain and torment. I know, I know, um, the evangelicals will tell you, well, he doesn't, they'll still call him God. They'll say he doesn't send anybody to hell. Those people send themselves, <laughs> themselves to hell. And I can tell you right now, I would never, on my worst day, on my most self loathing low day, decide I wanted to send myself to hell. And I know, I know. They'll come back and they'll say, well, they didn't maybe make a conscious decision. They didn't want to go to hell, but they decided to go to hell from their their actions, their lack of actions, uh, their so on, their so forth. Or, then the Calvinists, well, everyone was going to hell anyways because of original sin, of course. Because from the, the moment you um, exited the womb, uh, apparently you had already committed a number of uh, very egregious offenses in your genetics. Excuse me. <clears throat> but then it becomes, it becomes a circus of throwing ideas around and accusations and remarkably hurtful ideas too when you get into Calvinism or when you get into say like um, Christian identity who believes that no one can be saved but Israel which I too believe in a way not entirely we have to be careful with our terminology. I believe that Jesus, as he's known, he came to save Israel, those who were lost. He said as much. That's why I believe that's what he came to do, because he said it. <laughs> it's not rocket science. I'm not reinventing the wheel here. But the problem is how we're looking at it. It is a serious problem. And I think that most of us are looking at these concepts, one, in ways that we've just been taught. The other is in ways we most desire. And, and here's how that works. Kind of break this down to you a little bit. <clears throat> As I've mentioned, um, mostly in episode seven of, um, uh, the Obrey Hours. Uh, I can't find in all of the Old Testament the ideas of uh, like a spiritual salvation 
And what I mean by that is after you die, you go, you live on outside of your body in some state, we don't know exactly what, and um, you get to live uh, a really good existence. Okay, I'm saying I don't yet have not yet found that idea in the Old Testament. The Old Testament is absolutely the bulk groundwork of everything in the New Testament. You can't have a New Testament without the Old Testament. And if you do, if you have ideas in the New Testament apart from the Old Testament, you have a different belief system entirely. Let's just make that really clear. Whether you want to uh, believe those ideas um, in opposition to everything that, that can be found and proven in the Old Testament, or, or what. But let's be absolutely plain. If you believe ideas from the New Testament that cannot be well proven from the Old without um, a lot of gymnastics, but they, they're pretty clear. You have a different belief system than what is being expressed in the Old Testament. It's, it's simple. I cannot find that concept in all of the Old Testament, not even in Esther. <laughs> um, furthermore, now that was hard. <laughs> it was. I'm laughing, but I, I'm only I'm only laughing because I can't believe I didn't find it. I'm not laughing because I think it's funny. <laughs> I can't believe I didn't find it. And then I went looking for at least resurrection. Now, not, we're not talking about the words. Don't get the concept confused with what English words you can find or, or what words you can find in the Masoretic Hebrew or the Koine Greek where they they have applied English words like salvation or resurrection or thing which cause you to have a an idea or a concept in your head. That's not what we're talking about. We're not talking about those words that most of us have applied a concept to. We're talking about the concepts <clears throat> concepts. That's what I can't find. I can't find the concepts of a this sort of afterlife, good or bad, after death. I'm trying not to be too close to the mic, sir. I can't find the concept of a resurrection. Except... Now, I can find something that's, that's pretty similar, at least in Daniel. Which is, it's kind of tough, though, because in, in Daniel 12, what's mentioned is <clears throat> that a number of people would, would rise from the dead. Now, in what manner? Like, would that be a sign? Is that the actual people? What is that? I'm not sure. But we're talking about... I don't want to talk about things that are novel, okay? I don't, I don't want to talk about things that are anecdotal, okay? Because we do have things that are anecdotal. Um, we have how much people have read into um, Enoch, the the fact that just the narrative in Genesis says that, you know, Enoch walked with Yahweh, and then Enoch was not. Because Yahweh took him. Okay. What does that mean exactly? That's important. Because it could mean different things. And I think what I want to do 
I want to avoid reading my desires into the text. I want to know. I want to get the absolute best idea of what the text is really saying and what those words do indeed mean. What they were meant when they were used by their author. And when I say author, I do mean, in a sense, two people. The inspirer author and the, uh, the one who penned it, which really should be, a, I think, a, a synonymous term if we're talking about something that's truly inspired. So Enoch is anecdotal, I'm afraid. Um, Elijah, fiery chariots, it's anecdotal. Samuel, coming up from the ground when Saul goes to see the uh, witch, anecdotal. It's anecdotal. Why? Okay. I'm going to give you one reason, because this, the Samuel thing is kind of tough. And I've heard a lot of people... Um, I've heard a lot of people try to explain it. I don't know if they did the best job. So, this was really the last straw as far as Samuel turning his... Or Saul going his own way, not seeking the counsel of Yahweh, which he did throughout Samuel's life. In fact, Samuel would give him the counsel of Yahweh, and he wouldn't take it. He'd go his own way. So now Samuel's gone. Saul doesn't know what to do, because Saul's kingdom is slipping from him. It's been slipping from him for years. And now he's up against the Pelishatim. I do not call them the Philistines. That's what <clears throat> the people who pen these into these languages call them. They're the Pelish team. And they were quite a force to be reckoned with. Israel had to deal with them for centuries. Um, obviously, a constant border and land disputes as far back as um, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in this area, Gerar, and um, in surrounding areas, border, border areas. This is, this is not weird, not uncommon. What would be weird is if their border and territory and the, the, <laughs> the disputed land was Palestine <laughs> and they, around the, the Gaza Strip. I mean, um, you know, I know they've turned that into an open-air prison. Which not, that's not laughable. Um, the idea that we can see really easily the sort of numbers that Israel had just entering with Joshua. And they would just grow. And the Pelisha team had been around for long before that. They were a very powerful nation, which is why they were so feared and, and which is why they ruled over Israel for a really long time. So Saul is now embroiled in battle with them again. And from all the narratives, nobody liked being embroiled in battle with these people. If anybody's got an idea in their head that the sons of Jacob, Israel, were the, the best at anything compared to the people surrounding them, you've got the wrong idea. You're missing the, the point of the narrative and even the point of Yahweh choosing the children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, their descendants, as the people he would make a covenant with. Why would he pick the 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 prettiest, the most talented, the strongest, the best out of their race because they were really amidst a, a common race of people. We know that because we can trace them back to Noah. We can use some common sense about Noah, Noah's three sons, and how they would have to be a common race. Even if they were all different races from the start, they would have to congeal because they stayed together for such a long time. That's how this works. They have to be a single race. And races, like anything else that are created a certain pure way, 
even if you mix them and then leave them alone to seek their natural way, they'll, they'll go back to the original state. Anyways, so he's embroiled in these wars, and he goes to this witch, and he asks to talk to Samuel. He wants. All right, so and you have to understand this. First off, I believe, based on everything else I know, all the other information I've gotten from the Bible, and specifically the Old Testament, yeah, that's your foundation. That's all your big material. That there's no way that this woman ever in her life called up any spirit, ever. She, like every other palm reader, medium, whatever, out there today, was a con. She was a con. Now, does that mean that nothing strange ever happened? Or, let me insert this, that Yahweh did not actually send deceiving spirits to make it look like these things were so. Aha, uh -huh. because he says he would. And we also see it at the end of First Kings, when Ahab is going to go out to battle against Aram, and cross the Yarden. And then he brings in this prophet that he hates, and he, he tells him about this vision and how Yahweh is actually sending out lying spirits. Yahweh says in the law before Israel comes in the land that he would purposely send out people who were prophets that would actually prophesy correctly. They would have signs and wonders, miracles, things that they would show. So we're talking about things that are actually supernatural, like beyond the natural. He said, but these people at the same time, they're going to teach you against the law. He goes on to say, and I sent them to see if you loved me or not. So Samuel goes to this or, I'm sorry, Saul goes to this witch. He wants to talk to Samuel. He's going to go to mediums, which he shouldn't be going to, right? The con men that they are. And she's going to pull her con. He puts his money down on the table. And what happens is, she actually sees a vision of Samuel coming up from the ground. And she freaks out. She freaks out when she sees this. Why? If this is something that she saw every day, or many times before this, why would she freak out? She didn't freak out because she saw Samuel. That's who he wanted her to bring up. She freaked out because she actually saw someone come up. And all Samuel tells Saul, he tells him, I promise you, by tomorrow, at this time, you and your sons will be with me. What does that mean? We don't know that Samuel was in heaven. We don't know that Samuel was in hell. An apparition of him comes up from the ground to give a prophecy to Saul that he was going to be dead the next day. Because that was the last straw. It doesn't mean anything else other than that. Not that we can really positively argue. This, again, is anecdotal. All of these things I'm mentioning, they're very anecdotal. And this is what brings me back to a theme that you really do, you really do need to do your utmost at cultivating your own relationship with Yahweh. I wonder sometimes if a lot of the ideas that we've been taught or believe we believe concerning Christianity has crippled us in working hard to cultivate that relationship with him ourselves. Why? Well, because Jesus is the mediator, after all. We'll have a, we'll have a relationship with Jesus. What does that look like? I don't, depends on who you ask, I guess. So let me just boil this down then. Because I've named the big ones. Those are the real big ones. 
And um, everything else is going to be people having to pull from little bits and pieces here and there. You know, Job saying, I know my Redeemer lives and so on and so forth. Well, redeeming, that's funny because we can get into that word and we can look and we can see over and over that these words always, 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 <laughs> vast majority of the times that go back to a here and now concept. Here and now. So, having said that, all of this begs the question. And it, it, it doesn't mean that those concepts aren't there. It means that with the tools I've ha I, I have, and with the searching that I've done, I haven't yet found them concrete okay so we're just going to go from there i'm just going to tell you i'm not saying they're not there i'm saying they don't appear there not right now we know that the language has been fooled with a lot we do however that's all we can say we can say well they might still be there and that's true I'm just telling you, as for now, they're not. Even concepts that are difficult for me to prove because of the changing of the language. I can still perform word searches and concept searches, and I can still show you that there, there are, um, there are, there is a lot of evidence of this concept. And I can show you that in the, the use of terminology. And the thing is, with, with words, words always have to appear in a context for us to know what they mean. So you can get a good idea from the context of a lot of these things. If we're talking about some other kind of theme, let's just say. Let's, the idea of Yun in the Third Kingdom and when it actually came that I discuss a little bit in bringing it all together. This is what I'm referring to. But these concepts that I've just talked about, there's, there's not as much that I've found yet evidence. Eternal afterlife. Resurrection. Me saying that, again, does not imply they don't exist. But I ain't found them. Okay, so now that we've reached this point, Let's just say, for argument's sake, that, that, that that's exactly what we're finding or not finding in the Old Testament. And by that, what I mean is, there's no afterlife. This is it. Now, yeah, the speculation could go on forever about if it's fair or not, or how you feel about it. And I'm not trying to say that those things don't matter. They matter. I mean, I, I, I've had a lot of thoughts about it, for sure. And I, I don't think anybody wants to really think that that's the case, do they? Because, well, because first off, uh, everybody's the good guy in their version of the story. At least good enough to merit some kind of heaven. <laughs> the worst kind of people out there believe that there was some sort of justification or some reason, maybe, why they shouldn't be judged so harshly or punished so harshly. I think that's one of the, the huge defects in, in our nature, unfortunately. So I know a lot of people would probably say that that just can't be. That just can't, that just can't be. 
But why can't it be? Why? Why? Maybe we would say things like, <clears throat> well, look, I mean, does it make any sense to create a, a, a being? Let's just say a being made in the image of Alayim. I'll go from the Genesis 1, because Genesis 1 doesn't have Yahweh. Genesis 1, chapter 1, has Alayim. That's the term used. And it says that Alayim made Adam after his likeness. And we could speculate a lot exactly what that means. Does that mean purely physically? Or does that mean other attributes? And if it does mean other attributes, does that also mean um, just perpetual existence? Because we can't have his perpetual existence. His perpetual existence is perpetual back as well as forward. It's so complete in its existence that back and forward are entirely inadequate terms. They just are. <sighs> Wrapping your head around eternity is just something we can't do. I don't know why. But we can't. It's certainly a limitation. So we might say, well, that just seems crazy. Why would he make being in his image that, that isn't going to have some kind of an, an, an eternal existence? Well, I guess the people who believe in annihilationism, they can't say that because they believe a certain amount of, of people will be annihilated. So they can't, they can't say something like that. Um, and, and then there's, of course, the, the, the sickness that comes with the idea of people that believe that all human beings are going to one place or the other. <laughs> just, just, I don't know, man. That's pretty sick. It really is. And because then they have to come up with all kinds of um, weird excuses. Like, uh, like what about, what about all those, what about all those tribes of people that just, we have no, no evidence that they've ever even had interaction with any outside world. Like white people come to their little uh, neck of the jungle and in a soup pot they go. They've had no, no uh, interaction and they don't want it <laughs> unless they're hungry, I guess. <laughs> And uh, people come up with excuses. They say, well, maybe what happens is, uh, and I've heard this, by the way. I'm not making this stuff up. They'll say, well, maybe what happens is um, after they die, given they're given a choice. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll, go, I'll, I'll, go with the, I'll go with the cloud and the harp, please. Are there any of those lots left? <laughs> <laughs> it's just it's just bizarre it, it really is bizarre and then of course you have people that again I, I have to say Christian identity it's probably not entirely Christian identity Let, let's just say people who have been so radi radicalized concerning the division between the, the kind which is for lack of a better term, Caucasian, and other kinds, because there are a number of other kinds of people. Let's call them people. And they're so radicalized in their belief that they would believe that only the one kind, the Caucasians, had a soul or this eternal existence, and the, the other kinds of people do not. So... Um, then you have the problem of, of race mixing. What about their offspring? Well, they must be damned, right? I mean, if you're going to believe that. See it to its logical conclusion. Now, you could also 
look at the idea of well not maybe not not caucasians per se well what if this adam that we see in genesis 2 because at first the language seems to suggest that he is endowed he's endowed with the spirit of yahweh which is actually perpetual life which is interesting if he was endowed with that that means those before him where he was taken from which would have to be a specific race or kind didn't have that when he took this one and endowed this upon him then go forward genesis 3 or just the promise of the certain punishment okay which would be genesis 2 what was that promise it wasn't hell it wasn't torment it wasn't any sort of eternal punishment whatsoever it was death if that adam was given life perpetual life the adam from two then the kind the race species kind he was taken from and it had to be a kind in particular because adam doesn't refer to all people i'm not saying all people are not at least spoken of represented in some way in the bible because i don't know that and i think they have been hidden in other kinds of terminology and let's say it did which i think adam a may be a little bit more appropriate but let's say even adam a was just one race or kind let's just say that just for argument still we have to see that that kind before that adam was taken in genesis 2 was subject to death because the endowment that that adam got in genesis 2 was perpetual life the punishment for whatever this offense indeed was that we have come to regard as a tree and a serpent and a fruit and all that or whatever you want to read into that or you believe it doesn't matter the punishment though was death the loss of that endowment and it's it's the descendants of that particular individual that adam who are the centerpiece going forward of what we know is like the holy bible the old testament what we see when we see people that are the center of interest and not always just them this does happen to other people this is something this is a theme that i do have to explore in later works it isn't just this centerpiece people that, that endure this, but they do in a way that's a bit different than others because they have specific covenants that were entered into at a point in time that are perpetual forever. So there are different specifics for them because they're, they're in part of an agreement. But what we see is we see enough lawless behavior, death. A certain amount of lawless behavior, judgment the judgment can be disease such as was inflicted upon certain kings and other individuals it can be strife strain stress of life or yes it can be death there are specific specific laws that if broken require death as part of that agreement made with that certain bloodline of people death that's what we see so if that's the case if there's not an afterlife if this life is what there is and if our actions within this life do bear consequences and that is not to remove grace from the equation because everybody well 
I think, to one degree or another, especially in today's day and age, because there are, are extenuating circumstances, especially in this day and age, concerning how much we've been deceived. But I mean, those things aside, um, if we're looking at here and now, judgments for behavior here and now, those judgments being various degrees of discomfort, dis-ease, up to death. And salvation being something that is very real, um, that happens very much in this life, as part of this life, it could be referring to different things. Salvation from a disease, um, a terrible circumstance, or death for um, an individual or nation. If that is in fact the theme that we are seeing, <clears throat> then I would think it'd be very effective if I wanted to really keep a people subdued, really subdued. I would think it'd be very effective to teach them that what really matters is certain ways, if you, if you live in certain prescripted ways here and now, and one of those is definitely um, pacifism, obedience to authority, whatever that authority may be, things like that, concepts like that. If you believe in these concepts, a lot of them heavily New Testament peppered concepts, more than what you can find in the Old, a lot of them. Pacifism, you know, that idea. Um, bearing the misery, martyrdom, as a, as a noble thing, as opposed to, uh, uh, by contrast, a very different reaction to a certain situation, okay? If you could teach people and get them to believe that, really, the reward was later on. It was in the afterlife. It was um, down the road. Heaven or hell, resurrection, whatever. They might be far, far more passive. Far easier to control. Because why should you fight and struggle so hard against what's going on right now as long as you pay attention to these certain precepts? You do your best with, with sincerity, of course. Well, then you're going to have a, a great afterlife. That's your reward. Here and now, no, that's, that's not it. And when you see all of these statements of the here and now throughout the Old Testament, like Abraham and what he received here and now, promise of descendants, promise given in this life, promise of land, promise given in this life, promise of blessing and plenty, promise given in this life, that's just a metaphor. That's just a metaphor for what we're really going to get in the afterlife. Don't rock the boat so hard. Come on. Think about the afterlife. I think if you could get especially the group of people that would cause you the most they're just the biggest pain in the neck. Out of all the people you're trying to rule by secrecy, these people are the biggest pains in the ass. Now, if you could convince them that what they need to do is just chillax, trust the plan, look forward to the afterlife, it'd be a lot easier not only to control, but to lead to their destruction. 
No, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that's exactly what's going on. I'm just saying. Karl Marx, he was an insider. He knew the score. He knew what was going on, that guy. He said, what did he say about religion? He said, it's the opium of the masses. Why? He couldn't possibly have been talking about the Old Testament. The ideas expressed therein, the people of Yahweh, the servants of Yahweh, they act quite different. And what we see in the New Testament, and like mostly Paul, um, and various gospel selections, but not the entirety of the gospels. It's kind of a mixed bag. When we get to the Gospels, because there's four of them after all, and they don't agree. I'm just saying. If you want to rob an entire people of their strength and their produce, if you want to drain them of their thoughts of rebellion, because... Do you think an entire people would be more likely to very much rebel against tyranny and these queers that keep themselves absolutely invisible and do not fight their own wars and battles? They do everything by coercion and deception and underhanded trickery. If you knew that the entirety of your existence was here, now, and when you died, that was it. You were done. Would you be as likely, do you think, do you think a whole group of people would be as likely to put up with all the bullshit that people right now are putting up with. You listen to anybody, and if you can bring up some really serious topics of things that are going on right now that really hit home, if you can at least bring these things up with these people, and they will uh, acknowledge them and acknowledge how uh, insidious and destructive they are, there's always going to be that caveat. They've put it in Jesus' hands because they're expecting heaven forever. Their children are suffering, sometimes dying, but they're putting it in Jesus' hands in heaven forever. What if their children were suffering and dying because of what these invisible people have done? And that's it. Their children, who they love and adore, are gone now. They can't love and adore them ever again. They're gone. I just want you to think about that. Which people would be easier to subdue and control the people who knew that this was it or the people who were expecting some sort of eternal reward now again in that question I'm not saying for an absolute fact that that's that the things that I haven't found are absolutely not there, but I'm telling you, I haven't found them. And I just want to pose those questions, just food for thought. Because they've been nagging away at me for a long time now. And I think they deserve to be aired out. So that everybody can think about them. They should ask themselves that. And think those things through. So that's it today. And I'll see you on the next one.